Unless you've been hiding in a coffin for the last few years, you've probably noticed our current obsession with the undead, and vampires have become big business. This is Brand Castle in Romania, the home of Dracula. And they tell me it's never had so many tasty visitors, more than a million a year and counting. Most people who come here imagine the Dracula written about by Bram Stoker. Stoker was able to tap into the general sense humans have that something's wrong with dying and that we were made for something more. We should be living forever. But sometimes, being caught up in the fiction, we forget the fact that death is gruesome and not romantic at all. A shadowy figure who lived here and brought fear into the hearts of those around him was Vlad Tepish, known as the Impaler. And believe me, there was nothing romantic about what he did at all. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. I reckon David might have been walking through a place like this when he wrote that psalm. This is Titus Canyon Road. It runs through Death Valley in the Nevada desert. Apparently, it's the longest one-way road in the world. Quite ironic, really. Death Valley, one-way road. This is what I get for taking the scenic detour. Some people believe that's what death is actually, a scenic detour. Some place you go where life goes on just in another form. What do you believe about death, about being dead? Do you keep existing somewhere as a ghost? Do you come back as a fly? Or are you just, well, dead? Come in. According to Benjamin Franklin, there are only two certainties in everyone's life, death and taxes. Everyone will die. There's no escaping it. And across the globe, people deal with this reality in very different ways. My husband and I have been married for 11 years. But out of all of our anniversaries, the one I remember most was our first one, because we found out that I was pregnant with our first baby. We were so excited. I could finally have my own happy little family and give this little baby all the love that I'd missed out on growing up. I felt little baby flutters in my tummy and I even restored this old fashioned wooden crib. Finally, life was good. Then when I was 18 weeks pregnant, everything changed. Humans have always been intrigued by death. 
We've written about it, filmed it, get dressed up to celebrate it. But the reality is no one wants to die. In fact, we spend our lives trying to avoid it. So what are our options when it comes to death? Well, death could be oblivion. You're simply gone forever and your consciousness ceases to exist. Then there's the idea that death is a gateway to an afterlife of some sort. There's the idea of reincarnation and your consciousness is put inside another body. The type of body you get depends on what you did in this life. And it's also been said that death is asleep. Your consciousness rests. You aren't aware of anything. This suggests at some point in the future, you can be woken up. So there's a few options, but they can't all be right. So how do we know which one is correct? Where are you headed to, buddy? Uh, anywhere but here, mate. Hop in. Mate, I'll get on the tray. OK. All right, cheers. Yeah, bud, all good, thank you. Death's a lot like this road. It's a one-way trip. And no one's heading back in the other direction. Of course, you've got people who think they've died and been brought back again. Peter Sellers, Sharon Stone, and Ozzy Osbourne all had near-death experiences and saw a light at the end of the tunnel. But a near-death experience is just that near death. It's just like nearly winning the lottery is very different from actually winning the lottery. Consequently, we're stuck with a whole lot of conjecture about what's on the other side. And because we don't have any proof, we're not sure how or what to prepare for. Death is an important subject. Why? I read this t-shirt the other day and it said, it's not that life so short, but that death is so long. So it would be nice to really know what happens after we die, don't you think? It started with some very mild cramping and then some bleeding. So my husband drove me to the hospital straight away and a doctor came in and tried to listen to the baby's heartbeat, but she couldn't hear anything. She reassured me, saying that sometimes a Doppler doesn't pick up a heartbeat at this stage. So she turned on the ultrasound machine to have a closer look. And I could see my baby, but there was no movement. And I asked her what was wrong, but she just kept looking at the monitor and not saying anything. So I asked her, I said, please tell me. She kept looking at the screen and said to me, I'm sorry, there's no heartbeat. I felt like someone had just ripped my heart right out of my chest. And the next day I gave birth to a beautiful little boy. And he was so tiny. His little hands were just the size of the tip of my, my finger. His features were so well defined. He had these big long toes just like his dad. And we named him Jackson.
The Bible's epic story from beginning to end revolves around the question of life and death. The punchline of the Bible's message on death is that we rest in the grave until the resurrection. Some have suggested that this isn't the case, that we go to heaven when we die and look down on those left behind. But what does that mean? We have to watch the people we love suffer, feel pain and hurt? Doesn't sound much like resting in peace to me, and it isn't supported by the Bible. In fact, Jesus often compared death to a sleep. Take, for example, how he responds to the news his friend Lazarus has died. He says, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. They didn't get that Jesus had been speaking of Lazarus's actual death. They thought he meant natural sleep. So then Jesus tells them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And this isn't the only instance. The Bible compares death to sleep over 50 times. I'm headed to the cemetery where legend has it that the real Dracula, Vlad Tepish, is buried. What's interesting is that even the word cemetery comes from the Greek word meaning sleeping place. So I guess no one needs to fear Dracula because even he rests in peace. I'm here at Alcor in Scottsdale, Arizona, where a group of scientists reckon they've found an answer to the question of death. Alcor is actually a non-profit scientific research foundation that specializes in the field of cryonics. Now, I've heard of cryogenics, but what's cryonics? Well, in the, in the field of cryosciences, there are actually three divisions. There's cryogenics, which is the study of coal with respect to materials. There's cryobiology, which is the study of coal with respect to uh, tissues and organisms. And then there's cryonics, which is the application of coal to cryopreserve humans. Johnny, this is our, we call this our rescue vehicle. It's really a mobile surgical truck. We're gonna perform our procedures in this truck. We can actually perform surgery. We can transport a patient to, to Alcor. If a member is close to death, how far out do you guys get the phone call? Well, when physicians believe that one of our members is within seven days of death, in other words, doctors think that they may die within that time frame, we're going to send an emergency response team to their bedside, whether it be at the hospital or hospice. Uh, we'll prepare all the equipment and essentially wait. Once they've been legally pronounced dead, we're going to start our stabilization process within about 60 seconds from the time they are pronounced. When a, a person has clinically died, their heart has stopped beating, but really all the cells of their body are, st are still alive. Death is a process. It takes a while for those to die off. Well, we don't want that to happen. So we're going to restart circulation. Just like in emergency medicine where they do CPR, we need to do compressions which will circulate that blood throughout the whole body. We're gonna oxygenate the patient. That will oxygenate the blood and keep those cells alive even though technically the heart itself is not beating. Can you tell me a little bit about what this machine does? Uh, well, this is a compression device that we use to circulate uh, uh, blood throughout the body. This will allow us to continue this for hours on end without becoming fatigued. Most people can do CPR for five or 10 minutes. Uh, this is a battery operated device that will, as if I turn it on here, you'll see, It'll do that for hours on end. That compresses the heart, pushes the blood out throughout the entire body, and circulates just as their own heart would. So when you get the member to Alcor, where do they go to from here? Well, we're gonna take the patient and this portable ice bath and take it into one of our surgery suites. Uh, that's where we're gonna perform the procedure where we can put the cryoprotective uh, fluid into the body so we can prepare it to take it below freezing. So what's the difference between the freezing and the 
cryopreservation? Well, if, in freezing, if you were to take a strawberry and put it into the freezer, you pull it out and you look at it, it looks juicy, vibrant, really red. But if you were to set it on the counter, after a couple hours, it would just turn into mush because that freezing uh, destroyed the cellular structure inside that strawberry. That would be bad. That would happen to our bodies if we did the same thing. But if we can replace the water within the strawberry or our bodies with the medical grade antifreeze, then it never really uh, changes that cellular structure. It keeps it intact. So at some point in the future, when medicine science has evolved to the point where they might be able to repair it, we can reverse the whole process, warm the body back up, and the cellular structure is still intact. It won't turn to mush like that strawberry would have. So that's where the hope lies in this whole process. Exactly. Is that science will somehow intercede at some stage. That's our hope. And really our, our focus here is to ensure that we can minimize or completely eliminate any cellular structure damage from occurring for after death. So essentially we're just holding a body just across the clinical line of death so hopefully they can be resuscitated and brought back over that clinical line of life at some point. Mate, I was just wondering, in these pictures, are these guys members? Well, actually, Joe is a member standing here. Once we've performed our medical procedure, uh, they become a patient. And uh, it lists here, you can see the pictures of our members who have turned into patients. It lists their birth date and then also the date that they were cryopreserved. Johnny, this is really the last step of the cryopreservation process. These are doers. In each of these doers, there's 450 gallons of liquid nitrogen, and after the surgical procedure, the patients are placed in here. How many patients can one doer hold? Actually, each doer can hold four uh, patients. You see, it's kind of a circular, kind of a pie shape, and actually we have four quadrants in there where uh, each individual patient's put in a pod. The pod are lowered into it, and so we can actually keep four in there at any, any given time. In fact, we actually have 98 total patients in, in this room all together. So Joe, how do you feel you might end up here one day? Well, that's a good question, Johnny, because if I ever end up in here, that means that I've died. So I'm not exactly looking forward to it, but it sure beats the alternative of either burial or cremation yeah, and subject to decay, in which case there would be uh, absolutely no chance of me ever being revived and, and cured of whatever might have um, taken my life in the first place. You know, the next few months were so hard because the reality of what had just happened started sinking in. I was having panic attacks, I lost a lot of weight. I couldn't eat or work or even drive the car. I was such a mess. Then of course the questions and the guilt started. You know, why did he die? It must have been something I did. Will I ever be able to have kids? If I get pregnant, will it happen again? You know, Jackson had just died without warning. So I started thinking things like, what if I die? What if Mark dies? And I was just so scared. You know, my whole perspective on life had changed. Suddenly things that used to be important meant nothing. What was important to me now were like relationships and knowledge about life itself. And I really needed to know where Jackson was. I wanted the truth about life and death and, and meaning and, and purpose. I didn't want to waste my life on empty ideas and philosophies that had no substance. I just wanted the truth. And then after a lot of searching, I finally found it. This is the birthplace of the real Dracula, Vlad Tepish, in the town of Sigishwara, which is considered the vampire capital of the world. But even here, the only undead you'll find are the ones dressed up for the tourists. One of the most popular beliefs about death takes the view that a person goes off to their reward or punishment immediately. You know, heaven or hell, or in some cases, purgatory. 
But Jesus said that when we die, we simply go to our grave. Here we stay asleep until we're resurrected at the second coming. And this is great news. It gives us hope for the future and certainty for the present. Jesus says, don't be so surprised. Indeed, the time is coming when all the dead in their graves will hear the voice of God's Son and they will rise again. So what does the Bible say about death? What happens to us? Well, it's a pretty simple message. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. And for anyone who's lost someone, there's a beautiful hope in that. It tells me exactly where Jackson is. He's sleeping peacefully until the day we're reunited when Christ returns. I don't know about you, but there's something pretty comforting in that. So according to these guys, death is kind of like a sleep. Your animation is suspended. The people who come here after they die are hoping that one day medical science will get to the point that they'll be reanimated, woken up, and then they can pick up where they left off. The Bible offers a different hope. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, and there shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. Now that's a future worth waking up for. What we believe happens when we die goes beyond us it has implications for the character of God. God says when you're dead, you're dead. But if we say we live on, just in some other form, then we make God out to be a liar. And we reinforce the original lie from the beginning of this epic story that the devil told Eve. You won't die. As long as human beings have lived and died, we have questioned and struggled with death. My wife and I had the heartbreak of burying our own son. And I'm sure that all of us who have buried someone we love have experienced that heartache too. So is there any hope beyond death? Yes, there is. Our hope is centered in Jesus. Jesus died, but now lives. Imagine being able to take our loved ones in our arms again. And that's what Jesus promises when he returns to this earth to reunite us. The Apostle Paul said, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. So Paul is encouraging us with hope. And he goes on to say, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. So the first thing that's going to happen is the dead will be raised. Imagine being near a cemetery on that day. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus shall we always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. The Bible truth about the condition of the dead is comforting news. 
The Bible says that we rest in the grave sleeping. All our pain, suffering and worries and struggles are over. After death, the next conscious moment will be to wake up and see Jesus at the second coming. We'll be raised to live with him and our loved ones forever. Now that's what I call good news.